Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we're having a Databricks news day. So it is the end of January, and so we're taking a look back at all the feature changes, the platform releases, all of that good stuff, as well as a new Databricks runtime that is all available in January 2023. So yeah, we're going to have a look through. Usual reminders, we do have the new Spark Fundamentals training. Again, you've got the Spark fans discount code. So if you want to get involved, you want to do a self-paced online training, you have that discount code there. And as always, if you're new around in the area, don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know down in the comments what you're doing with Databricks, why you're here, what you're trying to get out of it, because it's always always nice to know what people are trying to do. So, yeah, let's go have a look at what is going on. So, as always, I'm in the Azure side of the release notes. There are different ones for different cloud providers. I've got the January 2023 changes, and we're going to go right to the bottom and then work our way up as we go. So... Let's have a look at what new bits and pieces, come on, what new bits and pieces we've got going on. So, first of all, most, they've changed the UI around again. Uh, there's now new bits happening. So that's mainly when we're in things and you want to have a look at how these things are working. They've slimmed it down. You can see these things a little bit kind of nicer than you could previously. So you can just have a bit of a play. So they've changed the UI slightly. You've now got some things hidden at the sides, which is fairly nice, a little bit neater uh, to go and work with. Uh, I've got some new things in the partner uh, connect, so we'll see Sigma and there's another one I think that's come through. Again, go and have a look if you're interested in those third-party solutions. Uh, we've got the new runtime. So we saw the beta and the GA announcements for 12.1, and that's got a few interesting pieces in there. We'll come to that once we've looked at the platform release notes. But yeah, one or two interesting things, one that I love, which we'll have a quick demo of. Um, got another... Terraform provider update. So we saw back in December and November, there's been this relentless cadence of changes happening inside the Terraform provider, and that's captured in the release notes. So you can see there's a few things going in. You can say which instance pool your cluster's going to be in. You can set up some stuff for Delta sharing now, and you've got some permissions you can do. So again, just increasing the footprint of what you can configure via the Terraform provider, which is great. Uh, another one with Private Sierra going into the Partner Connect. Again, these are all just nice samples. You can go into Databricks, click Partner Connect, and there's lots of just how to get started with third parties into uh, Databricks. Uh, we've got some more region coverage for uh, Serverless SQL, and we'll have a look at that in a second because there's also, we've made it slightly easier uh, to see what's in each region, so that, that just makes sense. Uh, another Terraform release. Uh, this time, kind of putting in some things in the Databricks SQL side, fixing some uh, issues. So that's gone out. So again, we've got more changes going in. Um, an interesting one on cluster policies. So if you're not using cluster policies, but you're allowing people to create their own clusters, you're kind of missing a trick. So cluster policies allow you to say, yeah, you have, go ahead, create your own clusters, but you can't have more than three workers and you can't use machine types bigger than this and you have to be on run, run time. So kind of just putting some guide rails still allowing people to go and create their own things and have their own autonomy. Uh, but you couldn't you couldn't stop people from creating more clusters. Um, so people could create loads of little small clusters if they wanted to. Uh, now, an extra thing in policies, you can say the number of clusters per user, which gives you that extra bit of control while still giving people flexibility. So yeah, it's nice to see that going in. Got the GA for 12.1. Again, we'll go and have a look at that uh, specifically. Uh, and then, yeah, so this is the thing I called out. So supported regions. This is something Databricks have put in. So if you want to see across Unity Catalog and Databricks SQL and SQL serverless and real-time model inference, what's available in what region? Uh, previously, you had like a different page you had to go to for each one, and it's just slightly annoying. God, I've already got the page open, but whatever. Uh, so we can go and see in here what's going on across all our different regions where are things available? So if you wanted to get onto the public preview for Databricks uh, Serverless SQL, where can you use that currently? Where well, you can see it's not available in most of the regions, Central US, East US, East US 2, and North Europe. So you can kind of go get that idea in West Europe. Um, you can get that idea of what things are uh, available in. So if you're thinking, right, okay, for this project, we'll talk to Databricks, we'll see if they'll put us on the, uh, the public preview for this thing, but that's not one of the regions that's supported. It's probably not going to work for your immediate things. You'll need to either wait until it's rolled out or do a POC in, in the right region. Um, so yeah, just useful having a single place we can go and check all of that stuff. Again, there's other things you can go and check out there. Things like IP uh, list, all that kind of stuff. Supported regions, things. So really, really useful to go and see. 
Uh, we've had some more things in the account console. So reminder, account console is that central management page. Um, so if you're in Azure, this will, or AWS or GCP, uh, whichever cloud provider you're in, you can go to the account console. And then from there, you can see all of the workspaces in your tenant. You can see all of the uh, meta stores that are being created and you can manage users and groups through there. Uh, so just allowing you to manage your email preferences through that account console, just kind of useful. Got another release for the Terraform provider. So putting in, again, kind of as you can see, max cluster per user things, adding so that change that went to the cluster policy already reflected in the Terraform uh, provider, just really, really catching up with what's happening. So that's cool. And then the flip side of your uh, account console stuff, it's just they've revamped the homepage a little bit. So there's just a few nicer things to go and see what's going on with you in that account console page. Yeah, nice. UI changes, making things slightly nicer and easier to work with. Um, on the jobs UI, so the jobs UI previously, they kind of as a previous update inside Deliberate Workflows, when you've got your jobs view, you can go into a specific job and you get that matrix of the succeeds and the failures and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and now they've just improved how that actually looks. So you can go from a single pane to here's all the list of uh, the jobs that I've run and here's all these, that success matrix, the green, 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 red, oh, that failed. Uh, just so you can get an idea of what's happened across all of your different Databricks jobs. Pretty about time we went and revisited uh, the whole of Databricks workplace. It's been a while since we've done a video about that. Uh, and again, they've made the UI slightly nicer for being able to play with these things. So if you want to go and if you're making changes to tasks, you'll see all the other tasks rather than just the task that you're working on, which makes life a lot easier rather than have go, all right, I'm on the task. Wait, what was the, what was the previous task in this job? and just it's really confusing no longer they've made that slightly nicer so when you're playing with the ui inside a job uh you can just manage them a little bit better and that's it so not a huge number of platform changes we are seeing um but there's a few other things that we can dive into so firstly we'll have a look at runtime 12.1 and some of the stuff that's inside there but also i want to have a look at something else we saw the databricks roadmap be released so i just want to point that out and make sure people know that's there and can go and have a look at all the interesting stuff that's coming so yeah, 12.1. So again, this is now a GA uh, runtime, so you can go and use it. Uh, it's got a few different things in there. So two things, protocol buffers. So if you're having a play around with largely streaming functions, uh, you can go and have a look with this proto buff uh, protocol. Is that a protocol? It's a proto buffer protocol? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so that allows you to take it, essentially kind of moving from binary to string or to a struct. Uh, so you can kind of pull that out. So we, we tend to see it when we're dealing with streaming data. So we're seeing like big, big streams of data and each one is just a big binary thing. We can turn that into the struct that has all the attributes of that kind of stream event message. Uh, and that's now in there. And again, hooks heavily into uh, when you do things like sort of, um, Confluence Schema, which is when another thing that we are seeing come in for this runtime. So if you're doing lots with Confluent and you're streaming data from it, uh, then protobuf uh, is in there. And you can now use the schema registry. I've not had a big play with uh, Confluence. I don't know too much about it. Uh, but I just know these are two big things that are supported as part of 12.1. Um, support for Delta sharing streaming. So previously when we saw Delta sharing, it was all batch. It was all allowing you to select star from um, particular tables. As of 12.1, you can stream from a Delta sharing table. So if you've set up a Delta share and you've like, give, allowed various people to register with that Delta share, they can now have a streaming job or even like sort of a streaming job with um, incremental timestamps, you know, kind of just saying, well, stream it, do an available now trigger, uh, keep the checkpoint, and then just periodically go and bring in any changes from that shared Delta table. That now works. So Delta streaming, was like park structured streaming now works when it is a Delta shared table, which is... Pretty, pretty, pretty darn cool. So, yeah, interesting. Go and see. Definitely need to have a bit of a play with that and see how that looks like. Uh, table versioning is now uh, now working if you're using Delta sharing. So someone can actually sort of say, well, select star from that shared table, version as of a timestamp as of. Um, so you can go and have a look at a particular state of that table. Clear. Timestamp, I've not had a play to see if version as of works. Timestamp definitely does. I guess as the recipient of uh, Delta share. You wouldn't necessarily know the various versions that Delta share has gone through, but you can do a timestamp of it to pull that back. So yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. Um, another one super interesting is merging, getting an additional clause. So when we're in a merge statement and we've got the SQL flavor of that merge statement, 
you tend to have a when matched and when not matched. It's fairly straightforward. And in when matched, you have a whole bunch of different qualifiers. So when matched in this column is yes, when matched in this column is an insert. And you can have these different actions. But one of the things that you don't tend to have is when not matched, but on the other side. So if I'm giving you data and the target table has a record that doesn't exist in the table and in, in the, my inserting table, what do I do with that? And it comes up a lot when we're talking about like slowly changing and we're talking about kind of various different ways that we try and get it to update existing records that I've not included in my new snapshot. Uh, and that, that is interesting. We didn't used to have that. Um, so I've done a quick little look at how that might look. So I've got a real simple little notebook here. Uh, I've just created a new database called Runtime12. Uh, we've got a basic table. Uh, I'm going to create some data. Let's, let's just get rid of that currently. Ah, let's just do a new table. It'll be fine. Do addresses too. Dress is two. We'll make this work. Okay, so we're creating a blank table that is, again, just some address data. This is how I just teach people Delta for the very first time. Um, just real, real simple. Let's go and have a look at some real basic data in a blank state. Um, we can go and just see what that particular thing looks like. So this is just going to be, there you go, some straight data. Not really fancy. I've got my records. Now, I've got an end date. I've got an effective date. And so what we want to see is I, if I've got some new data coming in, and if I updated, I don't know, kind of the, the top two records, I had 11, I had 41 coming in, but I didn't receive an update for 58. Now that is essentially, it's a, um, it's a delete. But I don't have another record. I don't have a physical record. I can say, well, that, that should be deleted because it's not in today's snapshot. So we've had to fit do that kind of manually before. We had to join the things together, find out the one that didn't satisfy the join criteria, have that as a separate thing that marked it up as delete. So if we want to say, I'm going to insert some new data and mark any records where the join criteria is not matched as a deleted record, this is what this new thing's for. So previously, uh, I mean, so I've just got an update here. So inside, inside the update, we're going to try and apply. I've got an update to customer 11. So that record is going to be updated. We do have a new update for that. And I've got some changes. So I'm going to want to apply those changes to it. Um, I'm not going to have updates for those two. So I've got an update for 11, an update for 12. 12 doesn't exist, so that should just be a straight insert. But 41 and 58, they don't exist in my update table. So the what you'd normally call delta, we can't really call it a delta because we're working with delta because everything's called delta. Uh, but I've got my, my source table that I'm applying into the merge. And I've got my destination table, my target table that I'm merging data into. So in my target table, I've got two records that do not exist in my source. And I want those two to have the end date updated okay they're ended at that point we got a snapshot those records are no longer live because we didn't get them from the source system therefore that should be a delete so in that case what we'd have previously done is to write a merge statement and i'd have had to do something before it to append in some additional rows to get, try and get that 41 and 58 into my source table but marked as with an end date i'd have to do an extra step uh, but now because we've got that extra thing so i can say well when it's matched, just update that record. Update all the rows in that record. When it's not matched, just insert it as a brand new record. But if it's not matched by source, and that is the new thing as of runtime 12.1, when not matched by source, then update the end date and mark it as closed. And that's just going to get really confused because I'm running it not on address 2, running it on my original table, which is still going to work because I was testing this out a minute ago. Uh, there we go. So let's just apply that into our new runtime 12 addresses to table and then what we should see if we go and have a look at addresses to we should see exactly that we should see those two records so 41 and 58 because they didn't exist in my incoming table have satisfied that when not matched in source clause and so they've got their end date set the record i had updated it did exist in my uh, incoming data and so it's become an updated address was previously it was ooh, a new address or a new customer address. So we've had our update applied. It has successfully, it was matched. So it was updated. We've had, it was not matched by source. So a certain column was updated. And then the, the new column number 12 is a sneaky new address. And that's just gone straight in. So that is brand new as of runtime 12. You've now got this when not matched by source clause in your uh, merge statement. Uh, one thing, if you're thinking that's a little bit unclear, you can also do this. Um, 
if you want to be explicit in your merge statement, you can just say, well, these are target match clauses. This is my source match clause, just to make it really, really clear what's actually happening in different scenarios. So yeah, interesting. And final one is an additional thing in terms of Delta, if you're converting things into Delta from Parquet, uh, it's now just better uh, in terms of getting stats and inserting the stats into your transaction log to make things run faster. Makes a lot of sense. I've not had a play with it yet. Yeah, I've not had a look at what the transaction log looks in terms of difference. Um, but I'm assuming that after this changes, we're just going to see the normal stats you'd normally see inside the Delta log uh, to make things a bit better. And then as you're normal, you've got your giant pile of bug fixes from Jira. You've got your library upgrade. You've got a load of stuff in there. As always, do take a look through that before you blindly upgrade your clusters and start using it in production. Please test it because you can just spin up a cluster with the new runtime and test your workloads rather than just blindly upgrading. And then, yeah, you'll be good. Now, the final thing I do want to point out is, uh, so a couple of days ago, uh, we saw the Dataworks roadmap for, you know, kind of the next, essentially kind of for this year, or for the next kind of um, half, I think it was, uh, has been published by Dataworks. So I'll drop a link for this down in the description below. But essentially, this is setting out kind of loads of interesting direction from Dataworks. So they're saying things like, well, yeah, we're moving towards serverless Databricks currently. And now we're seeing, you know, serverless real-time inference, seeing serverless Databricks SQL, seeing kind of they're just pushing towards not having to constantly manage compute. But they're putting a stake in the ground in the future and saying, what we want to get to is not moving from classic to serverless. What we want to get into is self-driving, where it's just doing its own optimization. It's doing its own cluster tweaking for you. It's deciding based on what you're asking it to do how it should do it and what amount of computer should do behind it. So there's there's a, a long way to go in terms of what they're trying to get to, but they're being they're setting out that ambition and going, we just want this to be easy and cheap and flexible. So I do definitely recommend having a watch through this. Sets out where they're going to go. Got some key dates in there. Got some interesting stuff that we're seeing coming out. So I'll pop a link to this down below and then you guys can go and check it out. But yeah. Lots and lots of interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, that, that is us for this month's updates. So again, not huge numbers of product um, releases. Some interesting stuff in there in terms of you know, a couple of UI tweaks, a couple of things around visibility and support and all that kind of stuff. Certainly 12.1, interesting purely for the new merge clause. It's just a useful thing that's going to just stop us having to do. We can just reduce the amount of code we write. That's it. I now no longer have to do a pre-step. I can now just skip that and... My life is a lot easier. Um, and that's about it. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Do check out the product roadmap and have a look at where Databricks are going. Just always interesting as an outsider to watch that stuff and try and see the direction that they're heading in, kind of um, what we're going to see coming later in the year. Try and predict what announcements we're going to see from the Data and AI Summit, which will be in June later this year. And, yeah, again, that is me. So, as I was saying earlier, we do have the new AA training now available. And you do have that 10% discount off Spark fans. Do use that if you're going to jump on the training platform and love to hear how people are getting on, feedback, all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, new people, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time. Cheers.